Please help us in welcoming Shelby Knox to the stage. Wow, what lovely introductions. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Um, I would first like to thank the Brockport administration, um, the administrators of the American Democracy Program, and the Brockport Women's Center for inviting me and welcoming me here tonight. There's no other way to begin the speech that I want to give but to say to all of you that I am sorry for your loss of one of your own. I did not know Alexandra, of course, but your campus's outpouring of love and respect for her has been so immense as to flood beyond the borders of your community and make those of us outside of it aware of your beautiful spirit. <clears throat> to our family, friends, and the whole Brockport community, I offer my prayers and my condolences. When I was asked to come speak here a long time ago, a long time ago, uh, I was told that I should address, in part, why and how women are still marginalized and victimized in our society. That message hardly seems necessary at this community, in this moment. Alex herself, the person some of you knew, whose talents and dreams she brought to this school, was incredibly unique. But the way in which she died, murdered at the hands of her boyfriend, is unfortunately incredibly common. In fact, more than three women every day are killed by their intimate partners. For an even more stark comparison, more women have been killed by their husbands and boyfriends since 9-11 than in the 9-11 attacks and in Afghanistan and Iraq combined. The question, I think, is why? On an individual level, it's probably one that many of you here are asking yourselves right now. On a global level, we must start by asking the question why we still live in a world in which all types of violence against women are still condoned, endorsed, accepted, and even preached. I don't come here tonight to make you sad. There has been a lot of sad. Um, and I don't come here tonight to give you an angry feminist rant, although I am angry. Anger is the correct response. In fact, there is no incorrect response. But I do want to tell you a little bit about why I get to be here at 26 years old in front of you, where I'm incredibly honored to be, um, how I got here, and why my hopefulness, even in light of the tragedy in your community and the tragedies that are enacted upon women around the world every single day can still happen um, and talk to you a little bit about why I think feminist is the best label you can give yourself ever. Um, can I ask you not to scare anyone? How many of you identify as feminist? Oh, okay. I might ask again at the end of the speech. We'll see if I'm effective. Um, so, as, I, as was mentioned, I'm from Lubbock, Texas. Has anyone ever been to Lubbock, Texas? Oh my, why? <laughs> no, really, why? I was uh, traveling as a women's athletic basketball team. Ah, yes, we have a very good women's basketball team. One of the very few things to recommend Lubbock, Texas. Um, and I'll tell you why. Lubbock is the second most conservative city in, in the entire nation. Does anyone know what the first most conservative city is? Thoughts? Provo, Utah. <laughs> Makes sense, right? Um, the joke was always that the Lubbock City Council got together and said they had a meeting and they were like, why did we lose? Um, they wanted to be the most. This is the city council that arrested the Chippendales, you know, the male dancers when they came to town. Um, and this was also the city when I was growing up in which um, it was illegal to sell sex toys in the city limits. So if you had more than six vibrators, you could, I, I swear to God, be charged with intent to distribute. <laughs> uh, so, and the most apt quote ever about Lubbock, Texas 
was from someone, from, uh, Butch Hancock from the Flatlanders, who I don't know if anyone up this far would know, but um, Life and Love of Texas taught me two things. One is that God loves you and you're going to hell. The other, the other is that sex is the most terrible, filthy thing, and you should share it only with the person you love most. So this is the, um, the town that I grew up in, and so as you can imagine, I was raised in a Southern Baptist family. Um, and so we were at church every single time the doors were open, I taught children's choir, I went on mission trips. Actually, we, um, we went to New York City to try to convert all the heathens there. Um, I really hope someone tries to convert me now that I live there. Um, but anyway, so part of um, being in this religious community was taking a virginity pledge. Do y'all have those here in places? Yeah, okay. So in, in Lubbock, Texas, it manifested in a series of, of courses um, called True Love Waves, which were basically all of the biblical reasons not to have sex before marriage. Um, the main one being, like, hell is really hot and unpleasant. Um, but the perhaps more insidious and damaging one, especially as it, it, it regards to gender, was that the young women at, who were mostly the ones who were part of the program, because if you didn't take true love weights and pledge to be abstinent until marriage, obviously everyone in church knew that you were having sex with everyone and would be shunned, whereas the boys, uh, it was optional. Um, but, so they were telling the young women that in order to be more like Mary, um, that you should not have sex until you get married, um, which was always a little strange. Um, but anyway, it was giving us the idea that, that we all had to live up basically being the mother of God in order to avoid hell. Um, so I, I did that, and in Lubbock it takes the creepy form of um, your father putting a ring on your, your ring finger, like your wedding ring finger, and then on the day that you get married, he takes it off when he walks you up the aisle and hands it to your future spouse. Um, there are, the creepier one to me, there is a version that um, you have a locket, and you wear the locket, and your dad keeps the key, and then on the, your wedding day, he gives the key to your future spouse, which feels a little too much like signing over the title of a car um, for me. But at the time, this was uh, not to be questioned. Young people are to be seen and not heard, especially in the church. To question is to sin. Um, and so this is what I believed for the first 15, 16 years of my life. Um, when I was in ninth grade, one of my acquaintances in a math class uh, came in after Christmas break, and she looked like absolute hell. She looked like her world had ended. And I asked her what had happened, finally got her to tell me that she was pregnant, her parents had kicked her out of her house, and um, the school was trying to force her to go to an alternative school for pregnant students uh, in Lubbock, not kidding, called New Directions. Um, and me, I was, had just taken this virginity pledge, and was a very spoiled little Southern Baptist girl in Lubbock, Texas, and so I said, well, how did you let that happen? How did you let yourself get pregnant? And she should have slapped me, but she didn't. She started crying and said, my boyfriend told me that I couldn't get pregnant the first time. And that was terrifying to me, because my first response was, oh, well, I guess that's not true. Um, I know, I was not a great teenager. Um, but yes, it, I realized that she didn't have that information. I didn't have that information. We were all entering into being in relationships and sexual people, and someone could tell us a lie, and it could end up almost ruining our lives. Um, and so I was disconcerted by that. 
and I had joined something called the Lubbock Youth Commission, and I wish I could say I joined the Lubbock Youth Commission because I wanted to make a difference in the world, but I believe that the biggest thing about talking to young people is that you shouldn't bullshit them because they have really high bullshit meters. I joined the Lubbock Youth Commission because I wanted to pad out my resume for college, um, and it was basically a council in which young people were to give recommendations to the city about things that they could do for young people. And so they put us in a room and said, what do you want to change? What's, what's bad here? And what kept coming up over and over and over again was that everyone had some friend who had gotten pregnant, who had a sexually transmitted infection, who had had to go with someone to the health department to get tested. Um, and then someone brought up, someone brought numbers. Uh, Lubbock had the highest rate of teen pregnancy in the entire state of Texas, which had the highest rate of teen pregnancy in the nation at the time. We also had the highest rates of gonorrhea, the second highest rate of syphilis, which at the time I didn't even know it still existed. Um, and so we were like, okay, we need to look into this. This is a big issue. And it turned out that the reason that we had all these high rates and the reason that my friend was able to uh, be tricked by her boyfriend was we had sex ed. Now, I don't actually mean we had a sex ed program. The pastor who would come into our public school in order to teach his say no, just say no to sex program, his name was Ed, and so we called him sex ed. Um, he was a interesting guy. He had frosted tips, buck teeth, and he talked a little bit like Bill Clinton. Um, and he would come in and well, the biggest thing that I remember about this guy was he would tell this story um, about the Hilton Hotel, room 509 in Austin, Texas, some year that that's the part I forget. Um, and then he would tell about, in depth, about losing his virginity and why he could remember everything about it because it was his first time and it was the best and um, like way overshare with eighth grade students. Um, actually with anyone. Uh, but anyway, so he would do this, um, and he had a whole program of basically saying things that were untrue. You can get an STI by shaking hands with someone. Um, that half of all gay people will die before the age of 40. No, not true. Um, and my favorite was he had a, um, a, a, a presentation he would do in which he would pull up a girl from the audience, always a girl, right, and say, he would hold up this nasty toothbrush that looked like it had been used to scrub toilets, and he would say, would you brush your teeth with this? And she'd say, no. And so he'd hold up a toothbrush in a box, pristine, and say, well, would you brush your teeth with this? I guess. Well, if you have sex before marriage, you're the dirty toothbrush. So, you can imagine why Lubbock has some of the highest rates of teen pregnancy in the state of Texas. Um, and so my, my peers and I decided that we had to do something about this. And then the solution, obviously, because young people are smart about what we need for ourselves, was we needed better sex education. So the first thing that we did is, being also teenagers and not incredibly realistic, we're like, oh, let's just tell the school district or the city council that we need better sex education. I think they'll totally listen to us. Um, so we got a meeting with the superintendent and some of the school board members and talked to them about why we needed comprehensive sex education and what that would entail and why it's a good thing and we were very prepared. And then they immediately went back to the Lubbock City Council and said that for the safety of Lubbock schools, please immediately disband the commission. So, just asking for it wasn't going to work, obviously. Uh, so we became activists by the seat of our pants. Uh, we had no idea what to do. There was very little support in Lubbock, Texas. So we did all of the sort of teenager activisty things. We got petitions signed, not online, but like in parking lots, um, which is creepy to me now that I'm a New Yorker, that you could go up to people and like shove something in their window and have them sign it. But we did that. We held a battle of the bands. We held many city, uh, citywide talks. Um, we held one event that I don't even remember what it was, but my dad was the only person who showed up. 
Um, and I tell you that because anything you do, that's going to happen. Um, and I cried a lot. But um, the uh, and one of the cool things that came out of this is that young people in our community were starting to talk about this. Oh, this is a real problem. Oh, we really need this education. Young people were starting to get really involved. But they also needed education right then. 